Hello, GopherCon. Uh, my name's Jeremy Brown. I am going to talk about uh, the word salad, uh, parsing without generators, parser combinators, ingo with generics, and by the end, hopefully, this will all mean something to you. Um, I'll say a little bit about motivations. Uh, I alternate salary jobs and startups. My last startup, we made giant vehicles and giant robot vehicles, uh, which was cool. At my new startup, uh, we're trying to replace precise but wrong software estimates with probabilistic but useful software estimates with our DoomCheck product. That doesn't roll off the tongue as well as giant vehicles into robots. Uh, and it's not as visually exciting, but it's honestly more useful to a larger number of people. DoomCheck gives you these detailed odds graphs uh, or a higher impact visual if that's what your managers, uh, stakeholders absorb best. And so the reason for this talk actually is that DoomCheck is designed, you write the entire work plan in an extended markdown format. So estimates go in curly braces and they go in as ranges. And um, so first, obviously, we want to render this markdown as a, a good looking document. But we also have to pull out all the numbers uh, to do the math to compute the probability uh, of success, uh, whether you want them in the graph format or the club to the head format. DoomCheck is implemented as really boring uh, software as a service. We've got a uh, database on the back end and then Go in the middle, but it's full stack, so we call that the back end, and then on the front end is Elm. Uh, but we're talking about the Go, and the Go is doing the parsing and the number crunching and some other stuff. And initially, I tried to work with a different uh, extensible markdown package, but I had a lot of trouble with that. So in the end, uh, I wound up writing a markdown parser myself using parser combinators. It took a couple of months, and it distracted me into giving this talk. So from a like getting things done perspective, you can be the judge if it was the right call. But it's a better API now. It's much more usable. And I had a lot of fun. And so I'm here to share that fun with you. Uh, I, I hope you will enjoy this talk. It's a bit of a speed run. Uh, so I'm going to talk about using parser combinators to make parsers uh, and how generics make parser combinators really nice and go. So in reverse order, I'm going to show you what they are, how to implement them, and how to use them. So, oh, and the last thing, I'm going to try not to say parser combinators for the next like 30, 35 minutes, uh, because it also does not roll off the tongue. Um, I think this is, uh, yeah, that's better. So parsers as composable data structures in Go with generics. So real quick, parsing is a field with rich theoretical underpinnings and a large body of literature, and uh, with apologies and deep respect to the scholars in the field, I'm not touching any of it. Uh, this is a practical talk aimed at people who might want to parse something with a toolbox of this sort, or, or at least want to see what it looks like. So parsing is, real quick, uh, fundamentally the act of taking a stream of tokens, uh, like bytes, characters, uh, that are supposed to represent a data structure, hopefully, and, and turning them into that data structure, or Ideally, telling you what went wrong if the representation was invalid. Uh, that's often hard, right? Textbook parsing, uh, which you may have encountered in a computer science curriculum, often broken into two steps, where the first is lexing, where we take the stream of bytes or characters and turn them into a stream, still a linear stream of higher level tokens, uh, keywords, identifiers, numbers, punctuation bits. There's still no structure to it other than the linear order. And then parsing, is where we take that stream of tokens and turn it into our resulting data structure, which we tend to call the parse tree, although it could be uh, any of a number of different things. You could compute a final result and just emit that. It's pretty common to generate the code for a parser using a tool like GoYak, uh, where the input is a, actually a grammar file that describes the language that you intend to parse. But it's also really common in the real world to just hand write a parser. And so you might easily see a parser written as a set of interrelated functions that call each other, uh, passing the remaining input along in some fashion, along with other state. So what we're talking about today is parsers built with uh, uh, composable data structures. And in this approach, you know, parser is literally something you can store in a variable, and it's ultimately passed to a function as one argument along with the input string when it's time to do the parsing. We are going to start by parsing a simple language. Uh, I think an example is going to be more interesting than a tedious taxonomy of parser. So simple configuration language. Here we go. Not markdown, by the way. 
uh, Markdown has stuff like this. Uh, the sum of the lengths of the, you know, never mind. I'm not going to inflict any of that on you in this talk at all. Uh, but if you want to experience it, look up the common arc spec and, and then cry. So here's what we're actually going to do is this very simple configuration language. It's just square brackets around a bunch of name equal value stanzas separated by commas. Uh, and you could do this one quite easily with Goyak or, or another thing. A grammar for that might look something like this. Some of you, this will be familiar. Maybe some of you won't be. On the left is a configuration is, then there's a colon on the right. It's brackets around some white space and some bindings. Bindings is either one binding, and then the vertical pipe is an or. It's a binding, some white space, a comma, a binding, or white space binding. A uh, bunch more rules, but it's basically a name is a value, a name is some letters, possibly some numbers, a value is an inter bool. You don't need to worry about the details now. Each of these rules will appear individually as we implement. So here's our integer rule, a Boolean, um, and white space, just as, as a few special characters. So the output of our parser is going to be a data structure. This is the parse tree. For this purpose, it's just going to be a, a slice of bindings. A binding collects a name and a value. And since we want to limit values to ints and bools, I've got a little marker interface and a couple uh, quick wrappers to implement it. So in an ideal world, we'll, we'll find an int or a bool in, in each of those. So this is what we intend to produce when we parse. So we are slide 29 or something. Let's build a parser. And we're going to do it by composing little ones into big parsers. So let's start with a very little parser. Uh, we'll start just by parsing the true token, the true value. Uh, so lots of ways to do this no matter what, but here's one way to build that parser. Uh, we're going to call uh, this function exactly from our parser library uh, with the string true. It's going to return a parser. Right? This is constructing a parser that parses the string true. Just a little bit of Go code. Um, how do we use it? Well, let's test it. Standard Go test structure here. Uh, we're, and for simplicity, you know, there's no table-driven testing here. I apologize. It's real low level. But we're going to call parse. We're going to pass that parser as the first argument to the parse function and the input string to the second, which happens to be the string true. Um, for now, we're throwing away the return value and just checking that the error should be nil. Right? If it's not, then, then we have an error. Uh, we can similarly test on the string blue. And here, we, we expect an error. We expect to get the no match error. I'm not going to show you tests for everything as we go, but one of the cool things about this approach is just the ability to do piecewise testing of each individual parser as you, as you get it. You don't have to have the entire language grammar implemented or develop a test that encompasses an entire uh, uh, valid expression in the language. And of course, if you were just at Katie Ackman's talk, as I imagine most of us were, uh, you know you could fuzz test this. So let's take it up a notch and check for bools, which could be true or false. Uh, so first, we, we meet our true parser with a false parser, which parses exactly the string false. And then we use a, a new function, one of. It's from, from our parse library. This is going to just try them in order. Is it true? Is it false? If it's the, one of them, it succeeds. If it's not, it fails to parse. And then we'll test this, and ideally, we can parse both the string true and the string false without getting an error. So there is an issue here. We've been throwing away the output. We know at the end here of any of these that we've parsed the string true or the string false, but how can we tell which one? So for the first time, let's look a little bit inside the parser package, just at some type signatures. Right? This is our first function. It's exactly. It's a function that takes a string and returns a parser. And this parser is generic. It's, this is specialized on empty. Empty is not a Boolean. Uh, in fact, empty is just a, a wrapper on an empty struct. Right? It's a marker. So it's a little short on Boolean information. And then one of, this is, this is a parameterized function, right? It takes arbitrary number of parsers producing the same type, produces one parser producing the same type. So the true parser is empty, and the false parser is empty, and the Boolean parser is also going to be empty. Our parse function is, of course, also going to return empty because it is also parameterized, right? And this is, this is where we take our parser and produce either a, a value or an error. So with all these empties, there's the question of how we get the actual Boolean value. So we're going to take a second run at true parser. First off, if I just wrote this with the explicit type signature, I was kind of omitting them before, but here we'll add it. I want this to give me a bool value when I parse. 
well, this is going to not compile, right? The compiler is going to say, you can't use a parser of type empty uh, where you would really like a Boolean. So sorry. Uh, that's, that's not allowed. So we're going to use this a new function, new to us function, parser.map. This is a transformation function. It takes a parser as its first argument, and it takes a function as its second argument. And it returns another parser. And all it does is the new parser basically runs the old parser, and if it succeeds, transforms the output type using this, this mapping function you pass. So here, we're actually throwing away, if there's a successful parse of true, we're going to throw away the empty value and just literally return the value true. So now we have something that will parse a true and return a true value. And we can test this, not only check the error, but now we can also make an assertion about it returned to the correct Boolean. So we add map to the API. Uh, it's a little bit more complex. It has, it's parameterized on two types. Uh, it takes a parser of one type, a function that maps that type to another, and returns a parser of that, that output type. So here's the rest of parsing Boolean values properly, right? We've got to do a false parser with exactly the same trick, except that we're returning false instead of true in our mapping function. And uh, then the, the Boolean parser, uh, we just call one of with our new, our new type, you know, Boolean typed parsers. Um, I won't show you the test functions pretty much anymore, uh, but this works. So let's do something a little more elaborate, a little more exciting, non-negative integers. So here's our rule. Uh, an integer is either 0 to 9 or 1 to 9 and some more digits. Uh, there's a bunch of ways we can do this, but we'll do this one for. So first off, I wrote this silly little uh, is decimal digit checker. It checks a rune, make sure it's an ASCII decimal digit. Uh, there is actually a Unicode decimal digit checker, but it also accepts uh, decimal digits that I don't know how to read, so I went with ASCII. Um, so. A digit parser that's going to consume uh, some decimal digits, we're going to use consume some and give it this condition. So consume some will consume one or more runes matching the condition. So this will get at least one, maybe more decimal digits, right? But it returns an empty again. So we introduce another little feature here, get string, which you wrap around a parser to get a new parser, and it returns the string matched by the underlying thing. So this moves us from is, it, is one thing a digit to collect all the digits to collect all the digits as a string and return those. Let's turn it into an actual integer. Oh, right. Here's our API catch up. Uh, consume some and get string. So back to integers. Now we know this won't compile, right? Because we've got our digit string parser returns a string. We want a parser that returns an int. Now, before we could use map to transform a result, we can't just use map this time uh, because we've our, our grammar rule here says uh, we will not accept a multi-digit integer that starts with a zero. Um, it's surprising resonance with Russ's talk earlier, actually. Uh, so we need to be able to say no and fail the parse even after we've pulled out this digit string. So we're going to use a parser function called and then, as in first do the digit string parser and then run this other function on the result, which will return another parser. And we can actually use that parser for, for two different purposes. One would be to actually continue consuming more input, continue parsing. Uh, but what we're going to use it for here is simply validation, because parsers can fail. And so this is our, this is our fail rule. Uh, if we have more than one digit, and the first digit is 0, then uh, return a new parser, which is uh, fail. And Type inference can't work for, because the parser already exists. You're not passing any arguments, so we have to be explicit here. Right? So this is, this is the fail. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and convert it. And actually, that can fail, too. Maybe there's too many digits. So we may, th there's another reason we could fail this, this particular thing. Otherwise, we return a new parser, which consumes no input and always succeeds. Right? So we've introduced and then uh, parser fail and, and parser succeed. Right? Fail is a parser. Succeed is a parser generating function returns a parser that always succeeds with the uh, values that you passed it. So here's and then, right? Takes a parser and a function that consumes the type of that parser, returns another parser. Here's succeed, takes a value, returns a parser that always succeeds, and here's fail.
uh, whose type is parser t. And we'll look at the implementation in, in a latter part of the talk. So next up, uh, we've parsed bools, we've parsed ints. Let's bring them together to parse a configuration value generally. So first off, this is the data structure again that we're going for. It's just a binding value with some little marker wrappers wrapped around an int or a bool. Uh, we could do this uh, with just without even this much, but uh, so as you might guess, we're going to use one of to bring these two things together. Uh, but of course, this would not compile because bool parser produces a bool and int parser produces an int, uh, so that won't unify for one of. Uh, but neither of these, if the, these underlying parsers succeed, this one of can't really fail. So we can use map. We just need to transform them. Uh, we're going to transform each of them with a function that takes their result type, a Boolean or an integer, produces a binding value, and, and to implement that, all we have to do is, is put them in their wrappers. Right? So all of a sudden, uh, you know, in, in whatever this is, 20 lines of code, we're parsing integers and bools, more than 20. So next up, names. Let's try a name. Let's remember, eventually, we have to do name equal value. Uh, so we're starting with an ASCII letter, and then we're taking alphanumerics for the rest of it. Uh, I've got some off-screen helper functions, is ASCII letter and is alphanum. Uh, so first, sort of conceptually, we're going to consume if we see an ASCII letter, right? It's 0 or 1, fails if, if 0. And then we're going to consume while. Could, always succeeds, can consume 0 or more. Right? So this is sort of conceptually what you want to do, this sequence. First this thing, then that thing. So first this thing, and then that thing. So phrasing is a hint. We're going to use and then again, but now we're actually not just validating, but we're sequencing our parsers, one after the other. Uh, and so in this case, the, the wrapping function, you know, we could get the first letter, but it's empty, and the result of consume while is also empty. So there's a whole lot of empty coming back out of this. But we've just sequenced multiple parsers. And we can wrap get string around that whole thing to at the last moment pull out the slice that we just recognized. And this is why these things are returning empties in the middle, because you often want to parse a sequence and then pull the string. So just adding to our API a little bit more, consume if and consume while, uh, join consume sum as, as all minor variations on the theme. Um, and finally, just a quick housekeeping note, our, our white space parser is a consume while is white space, which, which is another little uh, helper function. Uh, we never keep the white space. We don't care what it returns. It's, it's empty, of course. All right, this is a little bit of a speed run, but at this point we have the ability to parse a name, white space, and a value, so we can build a parser for a binding. Uh, we're going to do this twice. We're going to do it using the tools we've seen, which is a little painful, and then with some sugar. So we're going to start with a name parser, right? And this actually produces a string. You'll recall it produces a string. And then we're actually going to catch the name there in the function this time. We're naming it. We want to do whatever else it takes to produce a binding. Right? So first, parse the name, and then do the rest and give me a binding. Well, the next thing is we're going to parse some white space. We don't care about that. We don't name it. And then we're going to parse an equals. Right? We don't care about that. It doesn't get a name. Neither does the next batch of white space. Uh, there's kind of unfortunate down into the right trend happening here. So finally, we parse an actual value, right? Here's our binding value parser. And at that point, we've got what we needed. We got the name at one end, we got the value at the other. We're done consuming input. We just need to put them together in a result that is a binding. Well, we've given them both, so we can use map at the end here. The map binding function gives the value a name, name value. And so we can take the name from way up at the beginning and the value from way at the end and put them together in a binding and return that as the final result of our, uh, our, our binding parse. Right. This has uh, what I think they call in JavaScript the callback hell shape. So here's an alternate approach that uses a little bit of uh, sugar for sequencing. So we start a parser sequence with this call start keeping. Right? We're going to pass it a parser, and we get back a, a sequence, which happens to be a sequence of one value. Then we're going to use append skipping. It takes the prior parser as its first argument, and then we're going to skip the white space. We're going to skip the equals. We're going to skip more white space. We're going to keep. We're going to append keeping. 
a value parser. So now S4 is a sequence conceptually. We'll see how it's implemented later. But it's conceptually a sequence of length two where the first element is this string name and the second element is a binding value. So a little bit less of the callback hell shape. And then finally, to produce a binding, uh, we'll call apply to, which is the form that operates on a sequence of length two. We'll, it's going to transform this final parser with a, what is sort of a mapping function. This is where we get to name those sequence values finally, name and value. And then we just return the binding we wanted. So the sequential variable names aren't elegant, uh, but the compiler is really good about warning us if we accidentally forget to use one. So in practice, it works out pretty well. And I'm going to hold off showing you the signatures on these things for now. Now, this would be nice, just as an aside, if we could just dot our way along, dot, 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 parser, dot, skip, dot, skip, dot, skip, dot, append, dot, apply. Um, but that would require methods with type parameters on them. Keep would have to be able to have an arbitrary parser type, and, and you would be there on the keep. That's not allowed in the current implementation of generics. And so we're stuck with our temporaries for now. Uh, there is at least one active proposal, and by active I mean lots of messages accruing uh, to permit this. But I, I think the dispositive comment remains this one, uh, which is that it has not really been explained how to implement it, uh, especially in the context of reflection concerns. So uh, for now, sequences. Uh, so we're stuck with this, and I'll, so I'll briefly talk about organizing this kind of thing. This is, this is an aside to the aside, but um, once you get into building sequences, I've been talking like these could all be package level variables, but with the sequencing, now you need to like init blocks to keep all the temporaries, and if two of them refer to each other, everything goes, goes wrong. So we can do this in, a, in, a little, in a, some sort of function context, put a scope around it, and hide those sequence variables uh, from the outer scope. Just keep things tidy. And in fact, we can shove all of these local parser variables that we're creating all these small ones into a single larger structure, and they can reference one another as fields. Right? And this is now recursion can be done through uh, referencing back to the shared structure. Uh, so for everything we're doing today, there's a structure that looks like this. Um, note that the last field is exported because I'm lazy, so we're just returning the structure to anyone, but the, the in-package test functions can, can test all of the parsers. Um, and and this, is, this is what's in the GitHub repo. One function builds all the parsers, returns the structure. And from that, you can test everything or just use it as a consumer. So back on track, it's time to build a parser for a comma-separated list of bindings. And one of the things about one of is the parser can backtrack, right? It can start going down a path and decide, oh, this first parser failed. I'm going to try the second one. And so it's not generally a good idea to be doing like side effects like appending to a slice as you go through things that could backtrack. So I'm going to use this uh, really primitive linked list here. It can hold one binding and a pointer to another list element, or it could be nil. Right? This is what we're going to collect results with, and then at the end, we'll turn them into a slice. So here's the binding loop. Um, we've got a recursion here. We're going to pre-declare this variable. Uh, and so the first thing we do is we do the binding parser. And then, well, either there's got to be more bindings. That's the extend. Uh, or we're just going to succeed. We're going to say, OK, we're done. We parsed one binding. That makes us a valid list. Here's our linked list with length one, one element. The other field is nil, done. Uh, and the extend is going to look familiar. It's just the sequence. Let's part some white space, or then a comma, some more white space, and then recursively call the binding loop there. S3 is the recursive call. Right, so this will just keep uh, going as long as it can in the extend branch until it can't parse another comma white space bindings, and then it will return whatever it's got. Right, and then the final thing is just take the, the extend line there, takes your recursive bindings, prepends the binding that you got up in line, line three here and returns that. Now, because of the recursion, uh, if you have a really long list, you could conceivably blow the stack uh, because we, we don't do tail call optimization. Uh, there is a special sugar for stack safe looping. I'm not going to be able to fit that into the time we have today, uh, but it is on the GitHub repo. Uh, but the point is it's fixable if, you, if that run, you run into that as an actual problem. So then the final thing here is we just, uh, we, 
when we're all done, we put a final mapping around that thing that returns the linked list, loop over the linked list to produce a slice, and we return that as our, as our final bindings uh, uh, slice. Right. So tidying up, getting back to something that looks a little bit more typical. All right, so now we can finish up the entire configuration language with a one last sequence. You know, and we're going to get an open bracket, some white space, the bindings, and I'll point out that S2, where we append keeping, that's the only thing we're keeping is the bindings. Uh, and then we throw away the closing white space and bracket. And all that apply does in this case is pull the value out and return it. Right? So this is it. This is the entire configuration language uh, specified in, in code as composable data structures. In the next part of the talk, we're going to look at how all of those composition and creation things work. So we start with a big reveal. The type of a parser is actually a function. And then I'm going to call this a parser-shaped function. It's a function that takes a state. We'll see what that is later. And it returns either a value of its parsing type and a new state or an error. Right, that's it. Uh, so let's look at the simplest parser, fail. So fail is defined as a parser-shaped function, takes a state, returns a value, a state, an error. And since it always fails, all it does, the only important thing it does is returns a non-nil error, the error no match, right? This is it. That is a parser that always fails. Uh, error no match is nothing special. Succeed is a parser-generating function, right? So it, it's a function that takes an argument and it returns a parser-shaped function takes a state, returns a value, a state, an error. And in this case, all it does is return the value that it was constructed with, the same state, it consumed no input, and a nil error, right? So this is our parser generating function for succeed. Map is another function that returns a parser. And this, this one's actually exciting because we get to see a parser executed. So the arguments to map are the parser you're starting with and the function that you want to transform the parser output. Uh, map returns a parser-shaped function, right? It's a parser. Inside that parser, when it's actually executed, it applies the parser we got to the initial state. And we get back the result of the parse, the next state, or an error, right? So if there's an error, we bail out, we return the error, all done, very standard go. Uh, if there's not an error, we just apply our transformation function to the result and return that with the new state, the next state. And that's it. And then is very similar in structure. It's a parser generating function that takes a parser and a function that operates on the result, but it returns a parser instead of just a value. So it starts out very similarly. We run that first parser. If it errors, we bail out. If it does not error, then we apply our handler function to the result to get a new parser. Then we run that, and we return it. Whatever it did, that's our return value. We're good. We're done. If we had a full tail call optimization, this would not risk blowing out the stack, uh, but, but it does. So this is where we run into this uh, in term when we do these big ch chain parses and, and why there has to be a special form for looping. Um, one of. And I, I suspect these will become more and more obvious as we go through them. It's a parser generating function. It takes an arbitrary number of parsers producing the same type. It produces one parser. What does it do? It returns a parser shape function. Inside that, uh, do a little setup. But basically, all we're going to do is loop over the list of parsers and try each one on the initial state. First one to succeed wins, and we return its value. Loop, loop, loop. And just starting with the initial state each time is how we do our backtracking. There's nothing, nothing really clever about it. And then um, you know, if we fall off the bottom, uh, no problem. We just return whatever the last error was. I've been dancing all around state, uh, but none of the parts we dealt with so far have actually looked at the input. We've, we've talked about things that return fail or succeed or that compose parsers, but now we actually have to look at input. State is just a string and a number. Right? It's, it's your input data and the offset. That's it. We've got some convenience methods that'll help with the next things. So this one returns the remaining input given the offset at a certain position. 
And uh, this one advances the offset pointer and returns a new state. Since state here is passed by value, it's not a pointer. Uh, it doesn't change the original state. It's returning a new state. And, and again, this is important to backtracking. We don't mutate the state. We produce new states. And then finally, this one's a helper that gives you the next rune in the input string uh, and the state that you would get if you consumed that rune. Right? So this is state. It's just moving, moving through the input. So consume if. Right? Consume one rune if this condition is met, the argument condition. OK. This is a parser generating function. It returns a parser shaped function. And all we do is we, we call that convenience method to get the next rune. If the condition is not met, we did not match. We return an error. If the condition was met, uh, we return, an, the only important thing here is a nil, no error. Right? And the next state. So now we have consumed one rune, however, however many bytes that was. Uh, consume while actually has an identical signature. It takes a, a condition function. Uh, but instead of checking just once, it loops. It continues consuming and advancing the state as long as it has runes that meet the condition. It's OK for the number to be 0. It's OK for it to be a large number. right? But very simple internal structure. And then consume sum is just a sequence. We're going to skip the first thing. And we're going to skip exactly at least one character. And then we'll skip as many more as we can consume. Right. Get string, we get a little bit more into the state. Uh, remember, this takes a parser of any type and returns a parser that returns a string, which is the string matched by the underlying parser. So get string returns a function, which is a parser. We just capture the initial offset. We run the parser, that underlying parser. We throw away the return value. We don't care. It's probably empty anyhow. We get the end offset, assuming we succeeded. And that's our return value. It's the slice of the string from, from start to end. That's what was matched by the underlying parser, whether it was a single parser or a very long sequence of stuff. Uh, one more simple consumer, exactly, is a function that returns a parser. Uh, and what it does, it checks to see if the input begins with the entire character sequence, right? That was the argument to exactly. If the input starts with that, then we consume exactly that many bytes, and we return a new state, a line on empty value. If the input does not match that, then we return a, an error. So that's everything but our sequencing sugar. Right? That was enough to get through everything. The sequencing sugar, though, we get to play a little more with, with uh, some, some fun generic stuff. So start skipping uh, is a function that takes a parser of any type and returns a parser with on the parameterized and empty. Uh, and all it does is it maps away whatever value it had. So we're defining a sequence of length 0 is, is empty. So append skipping takes two parsers. It's going to run them both, but only keep the first value. right? So it takes parser type t, a parser type u, returns a parser type t. We're going to return the first value, not the second one, whatever it was. Right? And so implementation-wise, we're going to run the first parser, keep the value. If it succeeds, we run the second value, keep that va or second parser, and keep that value. And then finally, we're just going to return the first value. Right? Under the hood, this is a this is very mechanical process. Start keeping. Uh, now we actually need a data structure. So I'm going to introduce this. This is a, a, the seek type. It has two fields. They can be of different types. They're named first and second. Very exciting. So start keeping takes a parser returning a type t, and returns a parser which returns a sequence whose first field is empty and whose second field is a type t. So this is now a sequence of length 1. Um, and this is another mapping function, because actually all we have to do is run the underlying parser, get its value, and then sort of package it up in this sequence with the empty first field, which is kind of a marker field. Now before we move on to longer sequences, uh, let's look at how apply works on a single value sequence. Because this is, this is where we start seeing sort of the matching. So the signature on apply here is it takes a parser, but the parser has to be parameterized exactly on this structure, right? It's a sequence whose first type is empty and whose second type is whatever, right? So that's our sequence of length 1. It wouldn't match a 0. It wouldn't match anything that's not a sequence. And as you'll see in a bit, it wouldn't match a sequence of length 2 or, or more. And then it takes a mapping function. Uh, and so the implementation here, we run the the parser argument, we get back our sequence. 
Then we pull the real value out of the sequence, that's the seek.second here in the final line, and transform it with our mapping function and return that. Straightforward, hopefully. But the pattern matching on types is, is kind of the exciting thing here. Append keeping is actually pretty straightforward. Um, it takes two parsers of two different types, potentially two different types anyhow, and returns uh, both of those types in a sequence together, a T and a U. Right? So you can imagine we run the first parser and we keep the value, and then we run the second parser and we keep that value too, and then finally we bundle them together in the seek structure and return that. Um, now this is a bit abstract, but so let's look at a familiar sequence to see what happened here. So this is our, this is our binding parser sequence, right? Um, get a name, a white space, and equal a white space of value. And we're going to add type signatures. So the first thing we did was we kept the name parser. So that's a sequence of length one, which we now know is this seek with an empty and then a string. The other thing we do, or the next thing we do, is we skip a bunch of stuff. And every one of those does not change the type. Each of these returns a sequence of length one. And then finally, we use append keeping. And this is where we took the, the type on the left, which was the one length sequence, plus our new value, or our new type, which is the binding value, and we put them together. And so we get this nesting structure. The sequence of length two is, a, is nested too deep with the seek structure, and a type signature that's empty, and then the actual result value types. So the signature for apply to is designed to match that, right? It's the part it's going to take as its argument a parser that produces exactly that shape, right? Two nested too deep sequence. Apply three, same thing, but triply nested. You can go as, as far as you care to manually or automatically type out apply n. You get the idea. So real quick, the implementation is, is not going to be a surprise here. We're going to run the parser, and it's going to return our sequence of length two, which has this, this odd type. And then we're just going to pull out the real values, right? We're going to go into the sequence and pull out the first value and the second value, for, ignoring that, that empty marker at the beginning, pass them to our mapping function, which will return the final result, which, for instance, the binding value. I'm not going to hit you with apply three and apply four. There's just more dots. Last piece of this section, uh, let's look at the actual parse function. It takes a parser as its argument and the input string and returns either the type of the parser or an error. And so the initial thing it does is going to make an initial state, which is your, your input string with an offset of zero. We have consumed no input. And then the exciting next thing it does is it runs your parser uh, on that state and gets a result or an error. Uh, now, this is optional. It's something I, I did here because it worked for me. But the nice thing about this is a couple hundred lines of code. You can tailor it any way you want. I have a thing here that says, hey, if you didn't consume all the input, that's actually a different kind of error. That's the you left input in the stream. You might not want to do that. Maybe you, want, maybe you, maybe you have a reason for that. Uh, but that's it, really. You run the function, get the result, and, and you're off to the races. So that's all of it. Uh, so according to GoClock, uh, tells us that overall, the, the parser library has 373 like, actual lines of code. Um, that includes the stack safe loop that I'm not talking about today. Uh, and the grammar that we wrote for the configuration language was 228 lines of code. So around 600 lines of code here, 601. Um, and that, that doesn't include any tests, of course. As we approach the final minutes of the talk, I should tell you what parser combinators are. The, the word's back. Sorry. Uh, so a parser combinator is a function that accepts several parsers as input and returns a new parser as its output. So we've seen, in particular, one of uh, and and then. And almost everything else uh, was a parser generating function or some ancillary thing which uh, has relatively little to do with parser combinator theory, which mm, is probably why we didn't talk much about theory. So I want to talk a little bit about some nice properties of parsers as composable data structures, parser combinators, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so parser is a data structure, right? Um, and they're composable, and they're piecewise testable. 
and this is a beautiful thing. Uh, it's really easy to build a toolbox like this. You know, you're not manually advancing pointers in this, in this structure. You've got a, 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 a very powerful set of abstractions here. There's no non-core dependencies. The most exotic thing is the Unicode. Uh, it's very easy to tailor. It's a couple hundred lines of code. You can write one yourself. You can grab somebody else's and tune it. They're not big. Uh, and no code generation is required. Um, from a language processing view, these handwritten parsers can recognize languages that you can't really represent well with uh, context-free grammars for GoYak or its relatives. And uh, in particular, I found that beneficial for Markdown, which, anyhow. Um, backtracking in particular gives you some parsing superpowers, uh, but you, if you backtrack a lot, you will kill your performance, so there's, there's trade-offs there. Um, and then anecdotally, I think a reason many people have said they've turned to, to, to handwriting parsers uh, with combinators, but I think also just other forms, is you, it's much easier to produce helpful error messages in that context than, than through a lot of the parser generating tools. Um, finally, some, some quick Go-specific thoughts. Um, why did we use generics? Well, actually, I started, I wasn't using generics because generics hadn't come out yet. Um, so what if it was uh, just interface, right? Parsers return an interface. Uh, no, no square brackets, no messes, just interface, right? The good old days. Um, so before Go 118 dropped, this is actually how I was, how I was doing this, uh, with interfaces everywhere. And so there were type assertions everywhere, right? Panic factory. Um, and so you remember with, with generics, when I tried to compile this way back when, at the beginning of the talk, 40 minutes ago, uh, we got a compiler error. It won't let you stuff a, a true parser into a, or a, a, an empty parser into a Boolean parser slot, but uh, this compiles, <laughs> and it goes quite a long ways uh, because, uh, it, it, you know, it, it can make it this far, and, and then you don't have a binding value. You, you don't even have an int. It's just a string or, or whatever, or an empty. So oh, that one got the animation order right, right, wrong on that, but generics are, are anti-panic sauce. <laughs> Right? If there's no other thing that, that you like about them, they, they move so much to compile time. Uh, they made my life much better, in particular in this context. A um, couple things, I kind of touched on these we went through. Um, I wish there were a way we could permit methods to have type parameters. It would make things a lot tidier. Um, and I wish we could have proper tail call optimization. Um, but I realize that, that my wish list is, is just mine. Uh, last sprint to the end, uh, some notes on the code. Uh, a key inspiration for me, and really where I, where I encountered parser combinators, was in the Elm language. Uh, Elm is this uh, niche but, but really interesting uh, front-end programming language. It compiles to JavaScript but looks nothing like it, uh, which I find appealing, personally. Uh, and so... The API in this talk is based uh, very loosely on the API from the Elm parser package. That package is, is a much heavier weight and does a lot more. Uh, if you want more parser content, uh, Teresa Sokol gave a talk at ElmConf 2018 uh, specifically about the parsing library. And uh, so if you want to catch that, just to get a, a, a view of another library, or go play with Elm. Uh, the code for this talk uh, is on GitHub. Uh, it's at this repo. I will also drop uh, the link into the Discord channel associated with the speaker by my name. So, uh, and if you, I actually, um, because there's lots of topics that time didn't really permit me to cover in detail in here, I figured I'd give them to you as homework instead. So there's exercises. Um, I mean, one I, I would be to just go and look at the loop implementation, uh, but also. Uh, a cool thing you could do is write a look-ahead function. It's a parser transforming function that, that takes a parser, returns a parser. The parser returns the same value, but it doesn't advance the state. So you're looking ahead to see if, if the next part matches, right? It'd be a, a simple little parser wrapper. Maybe you could extend state to track line and column numbers so that you could provide better error messages or provide some other way of providing dynamically scoped data from the outside in. You might also want to be able to disable backtracking. Nothing we've done here lets you do that. Uh, 
And uh, an interesting experiment that I haven't tried, I'd love to see what happened if, if you stopped using just pure functions and instead used an interface, see if there was, uh, you've got some extra power, especially in the debugger. Uh, so that's all um, you know, stuff you could do for your entertainment. Um, and uh, that concludes the talk. I, I hope you had fun. I really think this is, this is neat stuff, uh, and I can't tell you how much better it got when generics dropped, so thank you to everybody who had anything to do with that. Um, I, we don't officially have Q&A slot, but it's lunchtime, so I will be happy to hang out uh, up here for a little bit to chat, and uh, if you can't chat now or you're really hungry or whatever, uh, please just say hello anytime around the conference, uh, and thanks very much for your time.